Hi, everyone, and welcome to Alpha Chat, the business and economics podcast of the Financial Times. I'm Cardiff Garcia. On the show today for the entire hour, Joe Stiglitz, the Nobel Prize winning economist and professor at Columbia University. Last week, we taped a long interview with him covering all kinds of topics. Stick around. That's today's show. I kid my students. I say, if you came in with those kinds of forecasting errors, you would not get a passing grade. Professor, thanks for being here. It sounds like you're having a pretty busy summer. It is. Very fun. Okay, so Rewriting the Rules of the American Economy, an Agenda for Growth and Shared Prosperity is the full title of this paper from the Roosevelt Institute. I want to start with a quote that you have on page 15, because I think it reflects what you've spent a lot of your career doing and analyzing and studying, and it also, I think, deeply informs the report itself. Here's the quote. Our institutionalist approach is based on two simple economic observations, rules matter and power matters. Can you just talk about what that means? Yes. It, this is a marked departure from the way econom- economics has been developed in, say, the last couple hundred years, where there was an attempt to look underneath the institutions to say, look, it doesn't make any difference whether there's unions or not, sharecropping or not, uh, how you run the economy. It's basically the laws of demand and supply that determine outcomes, outcomes, every, every aspect of outcomes, inequality, economic performance. So if you want to know where the economy is going, just look at demand and supply, technology. Um, that's the sort of thing. What we are arguing in this report is that there's a lot more uh, that determines how the economy performs. Uh, It's very intuitive, uh, but I think actually very important. For instance, if you have weak labor unions, power matters. That is to say there's a bargaining relationship between workers and the company that they work for. And the outcome of that bargaining relationship is going to be less favorable to workers. If you change the rules of the game to make it easier for firms to relocate abroad and then bring the goods into the country, then, again, the bargaining power of workers is lowered. The workers say, we want a higher wage, and the firms say, if we were to give you a higher wage, it would no longer be profitable for us to stay here. We're going to go someplace where there, there are no unions, where there are no worker rights, where there are no environmental protections. And under the new free, free trade rules, we can bring those goods back. And the workers have no choice, uh, especially in an era where there's a high level of unemployment. So – Another aspect of the rules of the game as we put, you know, is how things fit together. If you've weakened unions, you've extended globalization, and then you have a macroeconomic policy that results in a high level of unemployment, all those work together in combination to lead to lower wages. A little bit of evidence of this kind of theory is the fact that in the last 30, third of a century or so, the productivity of workers has doubled, but wages have stagnated. Now, historically, wages and productivity moved together, but that has not been happening. And our interpretation of one of the reasons it's not been happening, one of the important reasons, is that there's been a change in the rules of the game that go in a, against the interest of ordinary workers, and we argue actually against the interest of the economy as a whole. Yet, so the report does read as if you're trying to convince, I guess, what you might call the neoliberal camp rather than, I guess, a sort of a laissez faire conservative camp, which you probably aren't going to get anyways, right? So, for our listeners, I guess I'll explain this a little more because I think you just touched on this. The neoliberal view goes, I think, something like this. Markets, for all their imperfections, are pretty good at creating wealth um, and that we should leave them alone to the extent that we can. And then you use tax policy 
spending and transfer policy after the outcomes have been determined um, in order to make sure that the gains from the market forces are distributed fairly widely. Your argument is that actually there should be intervention before we get to that stage. In other words, that there are ways to tweak, according to what you just said, the rules, so that even before we get to the sort of post-outcome distribution phase, that the gains are already starting to be shared. So I guess what's, what's the macroeconomic argument for why you're right and for why the neoliberal camp misses something? And I will, I will inject very quickly that I think maybe a massive exception would have to be made for the financial sector, which has sort of clearly shown its need to have some kind of framework around it. But otherwise, um, the neoliberal camp sounds like it makes some pretty good points. So I guess what, what's your argument for, for convincing them? Well, I, one of the fundamental differences in perspectives is that uh, the old view had it that if you wanted to have more equality, the only way to do it is to impose taxes, which slow down the economy, and therefore there was a trade-off. The uh, Oaken trade-off, right? Between inequality and economic growth. Arthur Oaken, who was chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, distinguished professor at Columbia, uh, made that a central point of his book called The Big Trade-Off. Uh, more recent evidence shows that that's not true. That is to say we can have both more growth and greater equality. And this is not just a left-wing view. This has become a mainstream view, the IMF and the advice that it's been giving countries all over uh, the world, based on its own deep research, is that countries with more equality perform better. They grow better. They're more stable. And the theories that we talk about in rewriting the rules provide an explanation of that. For instance, if you have rules that lead firms to be more long-term, to think about long-term investments in their workers and their plant, their equipment and research, then the economy is going to grow uh, better. Uh, if you have s rules of the game that encourage short-termism, uh, focusing on not just the quarterly returns, but increasingly the nanosecond uh, returns, uh, you're not going to make those long-term investments. And then there's a connection between one of the important aspects of long-term investments is investments in people. And that's the link between productivity, growth, and equality. So, the, what we detail here is the many, many ways in which the uh, creating a more equal society is su supportive of creating a better performing economy.